Chris. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Irvin Kessels as today's keynote speaker. Irvin Kessels is a full professor at the Department of Applied Physics of the Eindhoven University of Technology, TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands. He is also the scientific director of the NanoLab at TU Eindhoven, which provides infrastructure for R&D in nanotechnology. Irvin received his Master's of Science and PhD degree in Applied Physics from the TU Eindhoven in 1996 and 2000, respectively. His doctoral thesis work was partly carried out at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and as a postdoc, he was affiliated with Colorado State University and Phillips University in Marburg in Germany. In 2007, the American Vacuum Society awarded him the Peter Mark Memorial Award for pioneering work to achieve a molecular understanding of thin film growth. In recognition of his research, he received an NWO VC grant in 2010 to set up a large research program on nanomanufacturing in order to bridge the gap between nanoscience, nanotechnology, and industrial applications. In 2019, he was awarded the ALD Innovation Award at the International Conference on ALD, and he became a visiting professor and Mercator Feller, a fellow at the Ruhr Universität Bochum in Germany. His research interests cover the field of synthesis of ultra-thin films and nanostructures using methods such as plasma-enhanced atomic layer deposition and atomic layer etching. Within the field of ALD, his research relates to ALD for photovoltaics and ALD for nanopatterning. Currently, Irvin is focusing his research on atomic scale processing, a field which is believed to grow in importance for a wide variety of application domains. Irvin chaired the International Conference on ALD in 2008 and the ALE workshop in 2020, and he frequently coordinates uh, ALD-related workshops. Irvin is active in the Society of Vacuum, uh, in the American Vacuum Society, and has been president of the Netherlands Vacuum Society. He is an associate editor of the Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology, and he is also the driving force behind the AtomicLimits.com blog and the founder of ALD Academy. Irvin, it is great to have you here. The stage is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Chris. Okay. I do have some problems now. <laughs> it just worked. Okay. So, still, uh, are you still seeing my screen? Maybe check. We do not have a shared screen. We do not, or you do? We do not have a shared screen, Aaron. Okay, I think something went wrong here, but suddenly. Uh, okay, now everything looks differently. Okay, let me just. Okay, hopefully it's up right now. You're good to yeah, go. That looks great. Okay, I'm sorry about that. It, well, that always happens when. So thank you very much for uh, for the introduction, uh, Chris. And uh, it's a it's a real pleasure for me to uh, being able to uh, present to you about atomic layer deposition. Um, so uh, and actually the the subtitle of this presentation is, is actually also the message of my uh, talk that is enabling thin film nanotechnology for a growing number of applications. So that's what I would like to uh, point out. Um, well, what I will do today is actually first give a very brief introduction to atomic layer deposition. I think many of you have heard about it, but um, uh, for those people that are not so much aware, I would like to bring everybody at the same page. 
And next, actually, most of the talk will be about ALD applications and also about the uh, associate, associated equipment because these go typically hand in hand. And we'll go over a couple of things. I will start with the semiconductor industry, which is the major industry using ALD, but then I will touch on solar display battery industry and also on protective and optical coatings. And I will describe the different uh, ALD reactors that ha have been developed and um, well, which is still being developed. And then I will summarize. So what is ALD? ALD is a, is a method to deposit ultra thin films with an angstrom level thickness control. So you can build up films atomic layer by atomic layer, as the name suggests, with an extremely good uh, growth control. Also, the uniformity is very good, and the, as well as the conformality. And the conformality is the fact that the thickness, if you have such a surface topology, is that the thickness is the same everywhere. So that is a very key uh, feature of ALD. Also, the fact that you can grow at relatively low substrate temperature is important, and that is typically less than 400 degrees C. So on the cartoon level, it looks like this. ALD is a CVD-like method, huh? chemical vapor deposition-like method, in which the film growth takes place by repeating cycles. And every cycle typically consists of two half reactions, here indicated as A and B. And you basically um, repeat these cycles to build up the film thickness, as you can see in this simple plot. So you do A, B, A, B, et cetera. Now, it's important that these half cycles or half reactions are self-limiting. The surface reactions are self-limiting. And that means that if you expose the surface to a precursor that, that will adsorb up to an atomic layer, which is less than a monolayer typically, and then the absorption will stop. So when you look at the thickness increase, you will see saturation. Next, you will um, uh, perch, and then you do the second half cycle, which is the co-reactant uh, that is exposed to the surface. And this will react uh, also in a self-limiting way. And then basically you have added an atomic layer of the material that you were depositing. Also, uh, you, have in, um, you have regenerated the starting surface again so that you, do, that you can do a new step A and B again over and over. The perch is very important because you don't want the reactant, the co-reactant, to meet the precursor in the gas phase because then you would get CVD reactions, and that is what we call parasitic CVD. Now, next, I will, hopefully this works, I'll show you a movie to show the prototypical case of ALD of alumina. Uh, and that, uh, for that, we can use the combination of trimethyl aluminum, this molecule here, and water. So let's see whether the movie will run. Here with us. So um, we're going to uh, zoom in on an ALD reactor. This is one uh, of our systems with a lopsometry. And we're going to look at the uh, substrate. It's a wafer, and that is terminated by OH, hydroxyl groups. We will expose that to trimethyl aluminum. So we have that reaction. And we basically make aluminum oxygen bonds while splitting off volatile CH4 molecules. This happens everywhere at the surface and then the reaction stops, it's self-limiting. We perch, and then we introduce the co-reactant, which is the water. The water will now react with the CH3 groups. It will replace the CH3 by OH, again, by splitting off volatile, volatile CH4. Then we have our OH covered surface again uh, after a perch, and then we can repeat this cycle over and over to build up the film thickness that we want. Now, maybe this movie suggests that the films are crystalline. That is usually not the case. The films are typically amorphous or polycrystalline. And that's also an important aspect. Um, the, uh, well, here I showed a cartoon, and just in case that the, uh, the, um, the video would not work, but I have just explained this. Um, and here you see a more sophisticated, uh, more scientific uh, description of the, uh, the cycle. And this is also something that we have investigated, we and others, just to see whether the surface chemistry is as simple as we as I just explained. For example, we have with mass spectrometry, we have looked at the reaction products when we dose the trimethyl aluminum and the water. And then indeed, we see gaseous CH4 that is released from the surface. Another nice method is surface infrared spectroscopy, where we can look at the surface groups. And if we do that, 
we uh, can see here, this is when we dose trimethylaluminum. This is the baseline. And positive peaks here, for example, this is related to CH3 that we create at the surface. While the negative peak is due to OH hydroxyls that we remove. So we remove OH, we create CH3. If you do now the water exposure, it's exactly the other way around. We remove the CH3 and we generate, we generate the OH. So it's a very nice clean chemistry, at least this prototypical ALD case of aluminum oxide. And there are many more studies that have been done with other methods, uh, quartz crystal microbalance, in situ spectroscopy lipsometry, et cetera. Now talking about lipsometry, this is also showing uh, some data here. This shows the very nice precise thickness control that we have. Uh, here we see different oxides and we see how the thickness increases with the number of ALD cycles. And if you would like to do 10 nanometers, you can see how many cycles that you do. This slope of these curves is what we call the growth per cycle. And that's the thickness per cycle, basically. And typically, this is around one angstrom. So a little bit less often also, but it's about one angstrom. This does depend on the oxides, as you can see here. So it depends on the materials. It depends on the combination of precursor and coreactant, on the temperature. But other than that, it is very reproducible. So if you keep the conditions fixed, it reproduces extremely well from day to day, from uh, reactor to reactor, from, uh, from fab to fab, anywhere in the world, it's actually very well uh, uh, reproducible. And that's one of the very important aspects of ALD. Um, here I also show some of the uh, precursors that you can use. Trimethylumin is a simpler one, but they can get pretty complicated, as you can see. So this is a huge field, the precursor chemistry, and also the coreactants for oxides. You can choose between water, or you can do ozone, or you can even do oxygen plasma. And I will come back to the plasma case uh, later. So one of the breakthroughs, one of the real milestones of ALD was its application in logic, in planar field, field effect transistors in 2007. So then it was really brought to high volume manufacturing. And um, since the early 2000s, it was clear that the semiconductor industry had an issue. So this is a transistor, a MOSFET, and people have been using silicon oxide for ages, um, well, for, <laughs> well for, uh, for many decades. And uh, the problem was that for scaling, the device gets smaller, so A gets smaller, but then also the thickness of the silicon oxide has to decrease. And that was giving some uh, trouble with the leakage, because when the silicon oxide gets too thin, the leakage currents become very high, and this is not desirable and not tolerable at all, for example, if you have mobile devices. So a solution to this was not using thermal oxide, but introducing now deposited um, oxides of high K materials. And it, the solution is the following, because if the K value is high, then you can decrease A while you don't have to decrease D that much. So you can work with a thicker physical thickness and still have a better performance. And that is realized by hafnium oxide. And Intel was one of the first companies to really introduce it in 2007 in their chips. Uh, and uh, here you see actually the hafnium oxide and tinitrite metal gate. There was still a little bit of silicon oxide, but that's to control the interface state density. Uh, but now in your cell phone, I'm sure there is a hafnium oxide into your, in, your, uh, in, in your transistors. So precise fixed growth control is very important. The other one is the conformality and the uniformity. And here, the difference between ALD and other techniques is illustrated. So CVD and especially PVD and PCVD are, of course, flux control methods. So the thickness here will depend on the flux of the species. And that makes it very hard to get a conformal film that is as thick here as over here, because the flux here will be much larger than over here. With ALD, that's not the case, because ALD is a surface controlled method. So you can just expose the surface long enough so that you have sufficient flux also here to reach this atomic layer. And uh, that's why this ALD is so important for conformality. And this was very important a couple of years later in FinFET, oh, in, in, in transistor technology, in logic, because then there was transition from 2D uh, transistors to 3D transistors. And now the, the, the planar silicon channel was replaced by a silicon fin, 
and the, uh, the high K oxide had to deposit it at all sides with the same thickness everywhere. And that's what you see here. You see uh, silicon fin, you see a little bit of silicon oxide, and then hafnium oxide and tinitrite. Very conformal, very important for your uh, computer, your cell phone, uh, whatever you ha have you. So, um, well, talking about this conformality, so you can do this uh, experiments where you do TEM uh, imaging, but we also uh, started to work with uh, VTT and chip metrics to work on uh, other chips that are very much better suited to check conformality and to understand conformality. So uh, VTT developed a chip. Uh, it's, a, it's basically a, a, a micro-machined membrane uh, over a surface that is then supported by little pillars, hence the name pillar hole chips. And there was a little bit uh, an entrance. And basically you have now a lateral high aspect ratio structure. You can deposit material in here and then the material can move inside this trench, in this lateral trench basically. And how deep that you get will tell you something about the conformality. And you can easily analyze this because you, it's a macroscopic trench. You can take off the membrane by scotch tape and do the analysis. And with this, we can learn much more about conformality and what's limiting and this kind of things. Here I show some results for aluminum oxide. Uh, you see here, this aluminum oxide was going into an aspect ratio of almost 500. But then it turned out that we're limited. We are limited uh, by uh, the TMA dose. So if we now increase the TMA dose, we can, um, we can go deeper. And then we are limited by the water. So this is the kind of things that we can learn from these uh, kind of experiments. And we get even fundamental data out of this, such as sticking probabilities of the TMA molecule and the water molecule, which is very important for understanding, but also for modeling. All right. So um, ALD is not a new method. This is a periodic table that shows actually the development of processes over the years. More, material, more and more materials have been uh, deposited by ALD. For example, cobalt, if you can see here, cobalt metal, then cobalt oxide, also cobalt sulfide will come up, uh, cobalt um, nitride. So over the years, many, many more materials have been deposited. It started in 1974 when the first patent application uh, was put in. Now, if you want to know whether a material has been deposited by ALD, then I would like to refer you to the ALD database, which is at our blog. It's for free there and you will find this periodic table. And when you click on one element, you will get a list of materials that contains that element prepared by ALD. You find the precursors used, you find the, the links to the publication, and you can just see whether this material has been deposited and how they did it. Now, I need to warn you that not all materials that are shown on this uh, periodic table are easy. For example, people often ask about aluminum, silicon, or carbon. Well, I think these materials, the single element materials are very hard, although people have reported a paper. So that is, of course, something that you, that's, that's what you have to check uh, as well. Okay, um, so that was a very brief introduction to ALD. Next, I would like to go over uh, some applications and also discuss the equipment. And I would like to start with this timeline that shows the first patent that was applied for in 1974. Uh, and then the method was still called um, atomic layer epitaxy, which was a misname, Norma, because the films were mostly amorphous. Um, there was uh, some uh, first application was in a thin film electroluminescent displays. I will show that later. But then early 2000s, well, the, in, the semiconductor industry became interested. Uh, I showed already the logic chips, so also in memory it has been used. Uh, but now also many other applications uh, are there. Uh, high volume manufacturing is also, for example, solar cells and OLED displays, but also many niche applications. So I mentioned already the field effect transistor, so I'm not going to repeat that. I just would like to point out that the hafnium oxide and tinitride uh, for these uh, transistors are typically deposited by single wafer reactors. These are like these examples, cross flow reactor, shower head reactor, working at a pressure of around one tor, and you just inject the precursor and the co-reactant one by one in a pulse train, basically. So that is being used for these uh, high K metal gate situations. 
for productivity reasons, people also, of course, often interested in batch reactors. And that's what I show here. This is just very similar to a CVD reactor, CVD furnace, uh, where you can just process many, many wafers at the same time. And this is, for example, the case for DRAM and other memory applications. So DRAM also has several ALD layers uh, inside. And here I show a DRAM a memory cell, which is basically a MIM capacitor, metal insulator, metal capacitor. Uh, you have tinite electrodes, and then this is the dielectric. The zirconia is used for its K value to increase the capacitance again. The alumina is actually reducing the leakage current because alumina has a high band gap and therefore reduces the leakage quite a bit. And that's also very important for DRAM. So this is also uh, already a very important application for many, many, many years. Relatively more newer is 3D NAND, yeah, so flash memory. Uh, this is probably in your, um, uh, in your laptop uh, with uh, solid state uh, memory. And uh, here, the, 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 uh, the advancement is that people have started to go to the third dimension. So they're stacking memory cells on top of each other. Uh, these are very high aspect ratio structures, 50 and even higher nowadays. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. Um, they do this by CVD methods, but also ALD is involved, for example, deposit the high K oxide and the metal, as you can see here uh, in, this, uh, in this TM image. So this is also a very important market nowadays. And um, well, semiconductor industry has really been driving ALD markets. So this actually shows for logic how many steps of ALD are involved. Intel has been using 70 steps of ALD in the 10 nanometer node uh, chip, which is the advanced, most advanced technology. What's important to realize is that only 50% of the ALD layers that are deposited end up in the actual device. There are also many sacrificial layers. And maybe this sounds a little bit confusing, but I will explain what that means because ALD is also used, for example, in patterning. Um, this is again a fin fat. You see three fins next to each other, and the distance between the fins is 30 nanometers, 33. The fin width is only six nanometers, so it's actually very impressive. But lithography, opt well, optical lithography is not having enough resolution to do this, unless you go maybe to extreme UV lithography. But that was not available five years ago. So people came up with a trick, and that is using low temperature ALD of silicon oxide and titanium oxide as spacers for pitch splitting. And let me show that in a separate slide to explain this. I think it's a very clever design. So what you need is in the end, you will need the, uh, um, the, the pitch that is shown here. So 30 nanometers, a line width you know, uh, of six nanometers. But lithography, you might, you know, you might only to be able to do this. This is the best you can do. So how do you get from the left to the right? Well, one trick is to deposit silicon oxide on the photoresist very conformally and at low temperature, because you don't want to damage the photoresist, which is an organic material. So you can do this, and you can do this by using low temperatures by plasma ALD. Then you etch off anisotropically, the top and also this part of the, the spacer. Um, and then you pull the mandrel, you etch away the, uh, the photoresist by an oxygen plasma, for example. And then you have this pattern. And this now you can transfer down here in the target material. And now you get a pitch that is twice the pitch that you had before, or twice as small. And the line width uh, of these features is now equal to the film thickness of the ALD film that you deposited. So this is, I think, a very, very nice trick. And this is used a lot. And for this picture that I showed here, this is the latest technology. It's not done once, but it's done twice. So we call it quadruple patterning, because otherwise we don't get this pitch. So um, this is a way where you use ALD, but the ALD film is not ending up in the device. And these kind of tricks are used more also for other applications. Now, um, plasma ALD, that is very similar to, to the ALD uh, uh, process I described earlier, but now you don't use water, you use a plasma as the co-reactant. But for the rest, it's pretty much the same. 
And why would you like to use plasma? I think it's clear. Well, you can work at much lower temperatures. You can also make materials that otherwise you cannot make, like silicon oxide is very difficult to do by a thermal process, uh, by thermal ALD process. Also, you, are, you need high quality films, which you can do better with a plasma. And for productivity reasons, you need short cycle times. And ALD is very good at doing this for these particular materials, as you can see here. These are materials that were deposited all at room temperature. Now, um, also ALD can achieve excellent conformality also for plasma ALD. But this was not so trivial. And there was a lot of debate going on in the last maybe five or 10, well, actually a, a longer time, but also in the last few years, what is the conformality of plasma ALD? Because some people were scared that this was not so good. And the point is here that people say, okay, you use oxygen atoms, you use them for surface reactions, but oxygen atoms can also recombine with themselves and making oxygen gas. And that has a probability R, and if R is significant, then if you have many surface collisions, you will, you will lose a lot of flux when the species need to go down and still react here. So people were saying ALD with plasmas does not lead to good conformality. Although people had some, some, some good results, but people were saying, oh, this is not very good in the end. So we did again a study with this lateral high aspect ratio structures to really show what's going on. And what we found is that PALD of material can be very conformal, but it's extremely material dependent. For example, silicon oxide and titanium oxide, we can go very deep. We can go to an aspect ratio of almost 1000. But for alumina and hafnia, it's way less. Although this, um, Aspect ratio is not bad for many applications at all, but okay, we also use very long plasma exposure. Um, we see big differences for different materials. And that was actually the outcome of our work. Silicon oxide and titania are heavily used for patterning, so that's okay. Some other materials, you have to see a little bit what the application is. And again, here we could extract some fundamental properties that are very important for understanding and for modeling. Uh, for example, the value of this surface reaction probability. Okay, um, well, and then we can, of course, prove it again on TEM structures. And this is, a very, I think, a very nice picture where we did a laminam, laminam, nano laminate on a trench with silicon oxide, titanium oxide, aluminum oxide. This is a pretty low aspect ratio. It's perfectly conformal, even the, the, uh, the alumina. So um, it works very well. Okay, now regarding to the, uh, the reactors. So um, for plasma ALD, we typically distinguish direct plasma and remote plasma. Remote plasma, the plasma source is far away from the substrate. There is still plasma above the substrate or can be. Direct plasma, the substrate is involved in the plasma generation. Now remote plasma is what you find mostly back in R&D reactors. And this shows our clean room. So we have many of these remote plasma systems there with all kinds of in-situ metrology involved. The direct plasmas are used for high volume manufacturing. And there I would like to show what's going on. What is the trend in plasma ALD tools right now? That is for productivity reasons, people are going to tools where you can do many wafers at the same time, but with a plasma approach, not with a batch ALD reactor. And this is a tool where you have 16 wafers. You can process on the time with a small footprint. This is a very clever approach where you use a carousel with six wafers and they go around here and you introduce the different uh, uh, gases, uh, trichlorides, nitrogen, plasma, nitrogen, and you have basically a merry-go-round. And that brings me to the concept of spatial ALD, which is, I think, a very important technology for some applications. This is the case, what I've just shown. So you, what you do is you basically do the ALD cycle as a function of position, not as a function of time, but as a function of position. And here, people are, uh, have developed all kinds of uh, uh, tools. Uh, this is a working at atmospheric pressure, uh, for example. Uh, but before going there, I would like to um, show another short movie again. So this actually shows the difference between spatial ALD and temporal ALD. Here we inject the gases one by one as a function of time. Here we move the wafer to different zones. And now if you work at atmospheric pressure, this nitrogen perch can be used as a um, gas curtain. And this is how you can build up your film. 
Now, I guess you understand the uh, concept. So um, let's move on. So people are now also preparing uh, atmospheric uh, spatial ALD systems. This is a sheet to sheet. This is a roll to roll configuration. Well, this spatial ALD is of course very important for applications where you need to process large areas. For example, many, many wafers. Uh, and you need high throughput, way higher than in, uh, in, in, for example, semiconductor industry. And one of the driving forces behind spatial ALD was the application in solar cells. And in solar cells, ALD is being used heavily right now for the passivation of the backside of the silicon. So this is the so-called PERC technology. And the backside is passivated by a very thin alumina fill. And this can be made by ALD. And if you buy now a solar cell panel, just an, a, a regular one, then you probably will have a PERC cell because PERC has uh, gaining market share now, market dominance now, and that has aluminum oxide in it. And very likely this is made by ALD. So um, that's actually where companies were uh, developing spatial ALD tools. I show here two examples. These tools, they can uh, process 4,000 wafers an hour. However, these were in production, they, may, they still are, but uh, in the end, uh, batch ALD took over again. So this is uh, a very interesting development that uh, this company, Chinese company, Lead Micro, has developed a batch ALD case with furnaces, and they build tools that can do even 10,000 10, wafers an hour. And here you see a silicon solar cell a fab and you see all these ALD tools lined up. So that is what the latest state of the art is. So that was about solar cells. Now a little bit about displays. I mentioned already that in the early days there were these electroluminescent displays that were made by ALD. This is a photo of the 80s. So then it was in production, very small production, but it was. Now the next step is in OLEDs. And since last year, ALD is being used to create OLED displays especially in curved and flexible OLED displays. And LG was what I, you know, the first one to do this. And ALD is used as a part of the thin film encapsulation uh, stack, where ALD is deposited on the OLED and improving the uh, encapsulation. And the first product is the catalytic Escalate that has this curved OLED cockpit uh, with, uh, with ALD layer in there. In uh, terms of tools, uh, well, before I forget, so for uh, encapsulation, it's of course several things are important, but I think one very important nice thing is that ALE is so con ALD is so conformal. So this was a deposition where a particle fell on the substrate and you can see here that it made a nanolaminate, so you can see it so clearly. So you can see how well this particle was encapsulated. So I think that shows the benefit of ALD. In terms of tools, there are people that have been going to these large PCVD-like tools. They make that in ALD reactors. But also here, there are people developing spatial ALD tools, sheet to sheet, where they even do some patterning by the ALD method itself. Um, another application would be in um, a lithium ion batteries. I've, this, is, this is probably not in production yet, but I think it will be soon. And uh, of course, battery field is a very active field nowadays. Uh, ALD can have very uh, many applications, I think, in batteries, uh, solid state batteries, etc. But one application that I would like to highlight here is the improvement of the stability of the cathode particles, which are lithium cobalt oxide cathode particles, by applying a very thin ALD layer. And if you do that, the stability of these cathode particles is much better for the, against the electrolyte, and that improves the lifetime. And uh, many, many people are looking into this, and uh, one of the companies that are supplying the, uh, the companies with the tools is Forge Nano. How do you do the particle coating? Well, there are uh, several approaches. You have to um, agitate the, uh, the particles to get a conformal coating. You can do this by fluidized bed reactors, such as uh, Forge Nano is doing. Uh, but you can also do this mechanically, for example, by a rotating drum. So these are the things that are going on in the field of particle ALD. Then um, there are many, many more applications uh, of ALD, and I, I, I don't have the time to go over this. I think uh, I just would like to point out that there are many applications, 
smaller scale applications where ALD is used for protective coatings or for optical coatings. I show here an example from Banek where they use ALD as an anti-tarnishing coating on silver jewelry. Uh, so you see the whole reactor loaded with uh, uh, jewelry and then they do a run. If you keep the alumina very thin, you will not see any optical uh, change, and, but you will protect it uh, much better. Uh, it can also be large area. There was a report about uh, mirrors, silver mirrors that were coated by ALD with a huge reactor. Uh, this is some uh, lenses that you can coat with a bandpass filter. Uh, I think there were many, many of these applications. Also more sophisticated optics. This is a Fresnel zone plate lenses where people use uh, something very clever. So there are many, many applications of ALD and, and uh, medical equipment. I think that's another one, uh, especially for protective and optical coatings. So, well, that brings me to the, uh, to the summary. Um, I think I've shown that ALD yields ultra thin films with a very precise thickness control and excellent uniformity and conformality. And you can do this at relatively low substrate temperatures. The semiconductor industry is the main driver. Yeah? So there it's really in high volume manufacturing. But high volume manufacturing is now also the case in solar industry. It's just starting in display. And I guess soon it will also be in battery this uh, industry. But then there are many other markets, maybe a little bit more niche markets, protective and optical coatings, many applications that we're just not aware of. Um, of course, in equipment, there is a large variety uh, and substrates in equipment and substrates. We can do wafers, you can do sheets, foils, particles. I think I've shown that. For productivity reasons, people who have going to batch ALD or you can do spatial ALD, very exciting fields. And then um, for low temperature applications, plasma ALD is now also a very important uh, alternative. Well, having said that, I would like to, uh, to thank the team and the co-workers and the funding. And I would like to thank you for your attendance and I'm happy to ask uh, uh, to answer any questions. I think there is some time for that left. Erwin, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Uh, we have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, just so everyone knows, if we don't get to your question, please send them to 2021questions at svc.org and we'll make sure that they get over to Erwin. Erwin, this question comes from Jeremy Grace. The question is for OH-driven ALD chemistries, does a remote water plasma enable a faster dosing reaction step than simply using water vapor for reacting the absorbed precursor? Are there examples of such use of uh, remote plasma uh, in uh, practice? Yes, okay, yeah, I think people have tried also use uh, water plasma, and I think there are some reports in the literature. Uh, I have not really seen that it is uh, giving so much better results. Uh, it might depend a little bit on the application, because water for the oxides that I was showing is pretty reactive and uh, you're not limited really by the water exposure uh, step. It's more the purging sometimes, certainly at low temperatures, the purging is harder. But I can imagine there are some applications where it could be helpful. Uh, and as I said, there are some, some, uh, some results out there, but uh, I'm not aware of any, you know, any uh, large application using uh, water plasmas. Of course, when you do water, you also have like several reactions at the same time, you have maybe oxygen atoms and you have water, so it also gets a little bit less well defined, but maybe that's, just, that's okay for the application. Thank you. Uh, this question comes in from Michael Hirsch. Thank you, Michael. It says conformity and atmospheric pressure CVD TIOS depositions can be improved by the use of ozone, if he remembers correctly. What layer thicknesses for non ALD deposition technologies? or the critical threshold when non-conformality becomes problematic? Okay, let me think a little bit about that question. Uh, you have 15 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I think that's, uh, 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 I'm not sure I, I, I understand that question because it has several, uh, I have to think a little bit about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, well, maybe well, you can well, write it out to me. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and again, Erwin, Thank you for honoring the SVC with uh, your time and attention and an outstanding lecture presentation.